the greatest pleasures in life are often the simplest, like making new memories with an old friend, the embrace of a loved one, watching these videos, or planning for your next vacation. The ability to remember and learn is one of the key aspects to your identity. It situates yourself through time and enables the processing of new information. Now imagine if that slowly starts to slip through your fingers, fragment by fragment. This is the reality of those with dementia that affects millions more every year. Now part of the key to reducing this loss is early identification. But how exactly can we verify that this process is occurring? Hi folks, my name is Cole and I have a Masters of Immunology. Today on Investigate, Explore, Discover, we're going to be looking at a new blood test for identifying neurodegeneration markers in Alzheimer's disease. So hang around with me throughout this whole video to get all of the relevant background information so we can dive into some exciting experimental results. There's also more information for you in the description below. Every three seconds, someone is diagnosed with dementia, culminating in over 10 million new reported cases a year. Right now, more than 55 million people worldwide have dementia, and this number is expected to grow by 40% by the end of the decade. On top of the emotional toll that it takes on family and loved ones, this increase would more than double the already staggering present cost of $1.3 trillion. Now, dementia is an umbrella term used to describe cognitive impairment. Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia that affects memory, thinking, and behavior that gets progressively worse over time. It affects women twice as much as men and is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Now, the disease is caused by the buildup of protein plaques and tangles in the brain, which can damage and kill brain cells, making it difficult to perform everyday tasks, communicate effectively, and regulate moods and behavior. There is currently no cure for Alzheimer's disease, but with an early diagnosis, medications and lifestyle changes can help manage symptoms and slow disease progression. Before the early 2000s, there was no way to tell a living person that they had Alzheimer's disease. It could only be confirmed with an autopsy. Thanks to advances in research, there are now tests to help determine whether someone has the disease. The ATN framework is a way of categorizing different biomarkers that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. The letters in the framework stand for the different types of biomarkers. A stands for amyloid beta, which is a protein that can build up in the brain and form plaques. T stands for tau, which is another protein that can accumulate in the brain and form tangles. Now tau can actually be further subdivided by phosphorylated tau, which is tau proteins that have been modified, and total tau, which is found throughout the body in organs like the liver, kidney, heart, and pancreas, and from neuronal axons. In fact, there are six isoforms of brain-derived tau, which are shorter than tau found in the periphery. Peripheral tau has an exon 4A insert, making it much longer. Now, N stands for neurodegeneration, which refers to the loss of brain cells and connections that occurs in Alzheimer's disease. This is commonly identified through the presence of neurofilament light chains, which accumulate after neural axonal injury. However, this marker is unable to differentiate between different kinds of dementias. The ATN framework suggests that Alzheimer's disease progresses through stages, with biomarkers associated at each stage. Now, this is important because it can help researchers understand how Alzheimer's disease develops and progresses. It may also help doctors diagnose the disease earlier and more accurately. In fact, there are a few ways that we can identify these biomarkers. We can look in the cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, which is more difficult to acquire because you can only really get it from a spinal tap. We can also look in the blood, which is much more accessible. When looking at the blood, there are different fractions that we can look at. There is plasma, which contains all of the blood cells and clotting factors, and there is serum, which is devoid of these clotting factors and cells. Now, with all of these biomarkers, we need a way to properly detect and quantify them. A pretty basic test is an ELISA, which uses antibodies stuck to a plate to capture floating biomarkers in matrix. This is then detected with other antibodies against the targets and is quantified using absorbance readings. Now, these usually have pretty good ranges for detection, but may not be able to detect tiny amounts of biomarkers. When detecting these tiny amounts, other methods must be used. A newly developed ultra-sensitive method called the Single Molecule Array, or SAMOA, uses antibody-coated beads to capture the target biomarker. These then settle into wells across a plate, 
which only hold one bead each. The fluorescence is measured and is proportional to the amount of biomarker in the sample, enabling single molecule detection. This gives scientists the ability to measure femtomolar amounts of protein, increasing the sensitivity around 465 times more than normal ELISAs. Now, I want to take a moment and really highlight why biomarker discovery research for Alzheimer's is so important. Collecting cerebral spinal fluid is not the easiest task in the world. To ensure wide-reaching diagnoses, we need to have an easy-to-collect fluid like blood. Now, following the ATN framework ensures that the diagnosing tools at our disposal are robust. We have these markers for CSF, and in the blood, amyloid beta 42 slash 40 and phosphorylated tau are used. However, taking steps to have a functional blood neurodegeneration biomarker can ensure more accurate diagnoses. With accurate diagnoses, we can make sure that people are implementing steps to slow the progression, like exercising and following a ketogenic diet. Now, if you also think that these are some important reasons to research this topic, go ahead and tap the like button. This brings us to the paper that we're focusing on today. This paper is called Brain Derived Tau, a novel blood-based biomarker for Alzheimer's disease type neurodegeneration by Gonzalez Ortiz et al. from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. In this paper, the authors report the development, analytical, and clinical validation of a novel biomarker that is specific for brain-derived tau protein. They evaluated the capabilities of this new blood biomarker to differentiate and distinguish Alzheimer's disease from other neurodegenerative diseases, and comparatively determined the associated severity of disease with other common pathology markers. First off, the authors utilized a whopping 609 participants across five independent research cohorts. This included a discovery, neurochemical, neuropathology, and two memory cohorts. Tau protein is present all throughout the body. Brain-derived tau, as the name suggests, is derived from the brain. This form is shorter, lacking the exon 4A insert. The authors used sheep to make an antibody that was specific for brain-derived tau, which they called tau J.5H3. This antibody selectively binds to the continuous exon 4-5 sequence of CNS-derived tau, and this was found to be unable to bind the peripheral form of tau protein. The authors next utilized the Samoa platform to create a novel immunoassay, which specifically binds brain-derived tau and used it to measure the protein from blood samples. They found that they could accurately detect brain-derived tau in samples that had been diluted up to eight times and across five different time points that they tested. Though I'm not exactly sure if this was freeze thaws, same day experiments or what, but they did it. Either way, they also found that they could accurately detect brain-derived tau from serum and CSF samples, even when they were mixed together. Furthermore, they could detect brain-derived tau all the way down to 0.03 picograms per milliliter, which is an incredibly tiny amount. Now, people with Alzheimer's disease have increased levels of total tau in their CSF, and brain-derived tau also followed this pattern. However, in the serum, total tau is not easily differentiable from people without Alzheimer's disease. But when detecting brain-derived tau, there was a marked increase in people with Alzheimer's disease over controls. From this data, the authors surmise that their assay can detect increases in brain-derived tau in both CSF and serum, making it a useful diagnostic target. Neurofilament light proteins are found abundantly in CSF of people with Alzheimer's disease, and it is also found at increased levels in the serum compared to controls, but was unable to accurately diagnose Alzheimer's. Serum brain-derived tau, on the other hand, could more accurately predict the presence of Alzheimer's disease. When the authors tested the plasma of individuals with Alzheimer's disease, so having these uh, cells and clotting factors present in the matrix, there was no marked increase of neurofilaments. But there was an increase in brain-derived tau. The authors found that increases of brain-derived tau in plasma were diagnostic of only Alzheimer's disease and was able to differentiate from other forms of neurodegeneration. To ensure that brain-derived tau can definitively diagnose Alzheimer's disease, the authors also looked in the brains of Alzheimer's patients to see whether any of the other normal neuropathological proteins are present. They found that an increase in brain-derived tau also correlated with an increase in amyloid beta plaques in the brain and with increased tau tangles. To quickly summarize everything altogether, the authors used sheep to generate an antibody against brain-derived tau protein. 
When compared to tau protein present from other parts of the body, their antibody specifically identified brain-derived tau. They used this antibody to develop an assay which looked at serum, plasma, or cerebral spinal fluid in people with Alzheimer's disease, and found that they could accurately detect increased levels of brain-derived tau. These increased levels correlated with known neuropathological markers in the brain, indicating that brain-derived tau protein could be an effective neurodegeneration diagnostic tool for identifying Alzheimer's disease. Now, not only do I think that brain biomarkers are exciting to investigate and learn about, they are also significant in a broader context. This information is significant because we have all the biomarkers in the ATN framework already for CSF, and in the blood we only have amyloid beta 42 slash 40 and phosphorylated tau. Because brain-derived tau can effectively identify Alzheimer's disease, it may serve as a potent biomarker of neurodegeneration, completing the framework. The fact that brain-derived tau can differentiate Alzheimer's disease also makes it a valuable tool for giving people correct and specific diagnoses. Furthermore, CSF is just difficult to get. Blood collection, on the other hand, is much less invasive and would serve as a better way to be able to predict Alzheimer's disease. All science is basically a stepping stone for new knowledge, and these steps are driven by questions. And I had a few questions myself after reviewing this information. Many things can happen to the brain over the course of Alzheimer's, like just injury, shrinkage, and neuronal impairment. However, there must be a reason for the release of brain-derived tau into the blood. So what exactly is the cause for the release of brain-derived tau? Now we saw in this paper that brain-derived tau can serve as an accurate predictor for Alzheimer's disease presence. But when will this be available for everyone? Will this be used as a general screen that people can get as part of their regular checkups? That way people can take steps to decrease the onset of Alzheimer's disease, like exercising and eating healthier. The population that we typically do tests on are white men. With that in mind, do these results change when comparing brain-derived tau secretion across sexes? For that matter, how will it compare in different ethnic backgrounds? As always though, my final question revolves around you. What sort of ideas or questions popped into your head when hearing about this information? I would love to hear about them in the comment section below. Also, let me know if there are any topics that you'd like to hear about in the future. Ultimately, I hope that you learned something, but more importantly, I hope you enjoyed doing so. If you did, give this video a like and subscribe for more in the future. Well, that's everything for today. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.